I read your book recently, How to Be a Conservative, and I think it's arguably a serious question, is conservatism s still alive mm -hmm. at all? Because we've seen in the United States, for instance, conservatism has been reduced to a type of uh, free market economy. It's really an economic conception and not really a moral uh, conception. So maybe we could just start. Yeah. Uh, well, this is one of the worries that uh, intellectual conservatives like me have. There aren't very many intellectual conservatives, it has to be said. Um, we, on the whole, take the view that ordinary people are conservative, uh, but they just don't articulate it. Mm. They're not ever pushed into the place where they've got to find the way of expressing their views rather than just having them and acting on them. But uh, when it comes to politics in a democracy, Politicians have to offer things always. Right. Uh, and that means that there's a natural tendency for them to put their policies and their suggestions in economic terms. They say, you will be so much better off if you vote for us than if you don't. Um, and gradually, the language of economics takes over every question so that it doesn't look as though there's any real distinction between politics and economics. And I think this is this has actually damaged the conservative position greatly because precisely what conservatives are trying to say is that there are things that are jeopardized, things that are at risk, uh, precisely because of our modern way of assigning a cost to everything, right. of seeing everything in economic terms, the profit and the loss dominating everything, rather than those things that really matter to the spiritual and moral health of the community. So, um, but you're absolutely right that, that uh, because of this dominance of the economic question, conservatism tends to be seen as simply an apology for a free market economy, right. come what may, you know. And so if there's a question about an institution, for instance, what should we do to protect the institution of marriage or, or primary education or whatever, it gets put into, an, an, into another form, you know, what are the benefits economically right. of the old idea of marriage? You know, who can answer that question? Um, you know, one of the things that, that is troubling to me, Berkeley is probably one of the ed most educated cities on the planet, just mm. in terms of a sheer number of PhDs, people that have, have been through... Uh, high levels of uh, academic training, and a lot of our neighbors are, are PhDs. We have one of the highest concentrations of Nobel Prize winners. What's really interesting is this is also one of the most liberal mm. um, cultures in the world. And so the question, and I think a lot of people see this, is that conservatism and intellectualism are almost mutually exclusive. And, mm. and very often the, uh, the conservative view is a kind of, it's almost, we've got some troglodytes out there that, that tend to present conservatism in a way that smacks of an almost anti-intellectual approach. And that's very different from, say, a Burkean yeah. type of conservatism, which acknowledged gradualism and the importance of change. Yes, absolutely. I, I, I mean, you... I've, I've suffered this all my life, that, well, at least ever since I became a conservative, in, which was in May 1968 in, in Paris. Paris. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and I didn't know, I hadn't a very clear idea of how to articulate it. All I knew was that when I looked down the street and saw all these um, rowdy students throwing stones at policemen, I, I just said to myself, whatever they believe, I, I believe the opposite. Right. And then I didn't know what it was. Uh, and, um, and then it was a sort of lifetime's work to find out what the opposite is. So, uh, and I somewhat arrogantly came to the conclusion uh, that it's, um, if you start thinking about politics uh, in an intellectual way, you are likely to be on the left. Uh, because that provides a systematic solution, an answer to the questions, gives, puts it all in a system, and, and also gives you a rather dignified and self-congratulatory place in the system. But once you started thinking, if you think a bit harder and longer about it, you'll move back to what you would have been 
if you had never thought at all. You know, and right. that's, my, that's my view as, as what an intellectual conservative is. He's, it's someone who articulates the real reasons for not having reasons. Say that again. Someone who articulates the real reasons for not having reasons, hmm. but just feeling and doing what's right. Right. Well, I think, you know, uh, uh, it's, I think it's Yeats. Yeats has a wonderful poem, uh, Easter 1916. Hmm. And, and in there he has the come let us mock at the great that had such burdens on the mind and toiled so hard and late to leave some monument behind. He wrote that when he witnessed uh, some Irish um, revolutionaries destroy right. a beautiful uh, house of a very wealthy uh, landed English, uh, Anglo-Irish yeah. person. And in a lot of ways that poem articulates that idea that it's very easy to destroy uh, yes. And tear down, and, and and one of the, I think one of the things that's so tempting for many people because the world is so troubling, to so many people, and and so many people suffer in this world, and and a lot of what the the liberal left tends to, to rely on, is is that sense of indignation that a lot of idealistic people feel because yeah. there are things that are deeply wrong with, with the world, but, but then when we look historically, at 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 how when these people have gotten into power, whether they're, I mean, people t tend to forget that the, the, the Nazis were actually, they were quite bohemian in a mm. lot of ways. They, they had a lot of leftist politics. Certainly their economics was, was tend to be collectivist and, and, and they were national socialist as opposed to being internationalist. Yeah. But when they, when they get into power, they, they tend to really, really tear things down and don't <clears throat> give us yeah. A, uh, well, I, I, I think there's an explanation of this. Uh, it's um, what Hegel calls the labor of the negative. Right. Uh, that um, the, the initial instinct on the left is that negative instinct, you know, that things are wrong uh, and it must, they must be rectified. They can only be rectified, however, by the seizure of power. And so we're going to seize power in order to rectify them. But once you've got the power, the negative is still there in your heart mm. because it, it's driven you all along. You know, that's the thing which has inspired you. So you set about destroying things, at punishing people. You, you find classes who are to blame. You know, the Jews, yeah. the bourgeoisie, whoever right. it might be. Yeah. Uh, uh, and you don't get out of that negative structure. Right. And I, I feel that's what... I felt very strongly in 1968, you know, that, okay, that of course there are things that are wrong in France, but there are also things that are beautiful and right, and you've got to go through this and come back and rescue those things, which is much more important than destroying a few obstacles along the way. Right. Um, Blake has an interesting, the, uh, he says, the hand of vengeance found the bed to which the purple tyrant yes. fled. The iron hand crushed the head and came a tyrant in its stead. And that tends to be a, 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 a pattern that we see again yes. and again, that when, if you have, for instance, in, in uh, Iran's a good example of that. I mean, Savak was, was one of the major reasons for the revolution itself, because mm. the heavy handedness of the Shah, yeah. his, his secret police, which he probably had no idea. They very often live in these silos oh, and bubbles. Yeah. Um, but uh, they've got, you know, the secret police, the apparatus all comes back. Yeah. And, uh, no, and the disappearing, uh, the people that disappear all disappear again. Yeah. So, th I mean, this is part of the problem. But again, it's still this fundamental problem. For instance, I mean, one of the things that, that, that you talk about in, uh, in Fools, Frauds, and Firebrands is, is the idea of power being the, the way in which everything is articulated. The, the mm. critique is about power. I mean, Foucault's a good example of yeah. that, of somebody who just saw everything in terms of power. But there's, there's definitely truth embodied in that. And I think that's why it's so seductive for so many people. Yeah. I mean, we have to deal with, with the fact that so many people are seduced by this because they experience, especially marginalized and disenfranchised people. Yes, that is true. Um, but of course, in the intellectual world, it's extremely corrupting to see things in this Foucauldian way. You know, you, instead of asking the question, is what uh, Hamza is saying true? I ask the question, you know, what power is advancing behind that? <laughs> 
you know, you then disappear from the picture, right. and also what you've said disappears from right. the picture. Yeah. I'm not no longer engaging with you, I to thou, at all, right. uh, uh, because th uh, without the concept of truth, there is no real engagement between people. All I am seeing is the power that's speaking through you, and that, um, of course, you can look at the whole of culture in that way, which is essentially what the postmodern curriculum is, right. taking one writer, one philosopher, one one musician after another and just talking about you know like uh, Susan McClary on Beethoven that this is uh, fantasies of rape speaking through right. this music you right. know uh, uh, anyway, it's, it's extremely boring after a while because it's totally well, mechanical it's, it, it's a lens I mean I, one hmm. of the things I say about critical theorists I, I you know that if it was a lens that it might be useful sometimes to just yeah. peer through that lens, but but it's a corneal transplant. <laughs> that's, you know, and, yeah, and, that's and a and good it metaphor, yeah. Yeah, it becomes the only way. Yes. And I've seen, one of the things that I've seen with students uh, in my own teaching experience is, you know, I've, I've had critical theorists in my classes, and whenever they raise their hand, I, I could almost verbatim tell them what they're going to say, yes. the response that they're going to give to whatever was said. Yes. And, and... Well, then we need to understand uh, why it is so seductive. Uh, That's my point. I, yeah. It troubles me how seductive it's been. And it also, I grapple in my own self with the amount of, of, of genuine injustice in the world yeah. that, that, that takes place on a daily basis. And I mean, for instance, um, you know, their attacks on capitalism to me... Uh, the corporate world today is so powerful, and to use a favorite term in, in that in that world is hegemonic. Mm -hmm. You know this idea where monoculture uh, becomes becomes so I imperious, and uh, we we've seen so many. I mean, I'll give you an example. When when I was young, um, one of the treats in in my experience was to go to a bookstore. Bookstores have pretty much been wiped out in the United States because mm -hmm. of these corporations so small bookstores are not able to survive mm. so now you have you you had borders but then borders goes bankrupt mm. and and then now we've got we're left with barnes and noble mm. and 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 so if you go in who's picking those books who's actually choosing what books like if you go for instance to to the the teen section it's almost all about vampires and really weird occultic mm. stuff it's not like you know the hardy boys or, or Nancy Drew sure. mysteries. It's, it's very corrosive ideas. Yeah. Uh, and we've slightly changed the topic now. We're not really talking about um, this postmodern obsession with power. Right. We are, we're talking about um, well, change in the structure of life. Right, and, but, but for me, a lot of, I mean, I'll give you an example. Herbert Marcuse, who I, I'm not a fan of by, mm. by any stretch, but when, when I read some of his works, I was struck by real insights about things that were very troubling about American yeah. culture. Uh, One-dimensional man, yeah. this idea of a consumer and, and life as consumption yes. and, and, and losing me. I mean, his solutions is a whole other problem. But, and this is something I think that's very seductive is that the, the critical aspect of, of, of Marxism and neo-Marxism has always been, it's always had a, a resonance in a lot of people. There's something very, mm. very powerful about it. When you, when you get to solutions and how we deal with these things, mm. we're in another realm. But if, 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 I think if conservatives don't really address the, the, the real serious critiques yeah. uh, that are there yeah. about the status quo. Yeah, I think you're right. They have, they have, uh, perhaps neglected those critiques, but um, you know, as I was saying earlier, the purely negative approach to the status quo is simply going to perpetuate this negativity and has done. Uh, you, if you're not, uh, the typical conservative in my reading of events is someone who looks around himself and he finds things that he loves. You know, and he thinks, well, those things are threatened, they're vulnerable, right. I've got to protect them. Right. Um, and, and it's not often that, that you find on the left somebody who looks around and finds things that he loves. Uh, it's, um, it's always something that's gone wrong, something that is even hateful. 
uh, and you've got to mobilize against it. If you've lost any sense that actually the world is lovable, and that there are things therefore to be rescued in it, you have actually lost the, the sense of why there is such a thing as a community in the first place. Mm. And that I think is one of the things that I felt very strongly throughout my life, that, that there really are wonderful things that we've inherited. All Americans, however, at whatever position in society they are, are still heirs to something rather remarkable, you know, a rule of law which is, goes on perpetuating itself from generation to generation. If, they, if only people knew how rare that was, they would see that they've got a fight to preserve it. You know, uh, uh, and the same with so many other institutions that we've yeah, inherited. Yeah, no, I, 